To start, I'd like to thank all of my nominators and the award committee for this honor. Special shout out to Professor Becca Clausen and Emily Plenser for the initial nominations and continued uh, encouragement. Um, you know, I must admit when I first found out about this award, uh, I was a, a little intimidated. Uh, instead of dwelling on that, I wanted to make the most of this opportunity and share my journey and research directions. So that's why we'll be going through 48 slides in 12 minutes. So <laughs> Beth was worried about that. <laughs> So yeah, I was an ordinary kid growing up in San Jose, California, which has incredible Vietnamese food if you ever go visit. I never played an instrument, never played a sport, or attended any special camps. Uh, my parents were immigrants and they didn't go to college and they didn't really push me to go in school, but I did reasonably well in terms of grades, not valid Victorian or anything like that. Um, it was actually some college students nearby who came to my high school for an outreach event that encouraged me to apply to college. So I was lucky to live close to one of the best public schools in the world, uh, UC Berkeley. Going to Berkeley changed my life on so many levels. Through financial aid, I was able to take classes from the most inspirational professors, surround myself with so many creative peers, and experience new adventures. It was the first time I went on an airplane, for instance, and you know, live by myself. Uh, I ended up working for Professor Sujay King Liu in electrical engineering, where I studied etch rates in nano gaps for device fabrication. My mentor, Donovan Lee, actually gifted me my uh, first chip that I made, which I have in my office. I still have it as a reminder of where I came from, from a research perspective. And, you know, looking back, uh, I think I was incredibly lucky to have had my first role model be a woman and also a Southeast Asian mentor. You know, really having relatable mentors and role models contributed to my sense of belonging in the research group, especially in engineering, and allowed me to focus on growing as a scientist uninhibited. After graduating, uh, I actually need to stay near home because my dad became ill. So I worked at the Molecular Foundry with Dr. Ron Zuckerman on the robotic synthesis of peptoids for nanomaterials and protein bond binding. Uh, so if you don't know Ron, Ron is this sort of calm, encouraging, all-knowing peptoid king that really empowered his undergraduates to pursue their scientific curiosities. He's still a close mentor of mine and has given me guidance throughout my entire career, really. For my PhD, I went to Columbia because I was captivated by this new professor named Luis Campos. He had all these crazy ideas in lab and teaching that I'm just now appreciating as a PI. Um, it was, I was the first PhD awarded in the group, and I worked on block polymers templates for nanostructured materials. This period is when I really became a chemist. It's the first time I used a Schlenk line, became comfortable using a rotavap, and really understood that I could make molecules that I dream of, right? Um, and it really showed me the power of chemistry. When I was thinking about my next steps, I wanted to work for someone who was doing the most exciting research in polymers, but also an incredible mentor. Uh, Janan was the perfect match. Um, what I did not expect was how much I'd learn about leadership, management, and grant writing. Uh, she gave me space to discover what type of person I wanted to become. And it was here that I decided to become a professor. I worked on making semiconducting polymers concurrently degradable and stretchable. And I really saw how chemistry and engineering must be integrated to find solutions to today's challenges. You can see it was a huge uh, group as well. So it was my first time being in this type of environment. So I'd like to take a moment to really say that I can talk about my mentors for hours. Uh, they really shaped me uh, as a researcher, PI, and person. And these brief minutes do not really capture everything, but I must move forward. <laughs> so my next step was uh, something that was really unexpected. I came to Canada uh, to start my own research group. And here, you know, I... I can't, I can't really look back. I have the best students. I, I know I'm biased, but I, <laughs> I like to say I'm not as well. But um, yeah, we, we like Ben mentioned today in his talk, uh, we have a lot of fun in the lab, but also thinking a lot about teamwork and a group culture as well. 
if you know me, then uh, you may know that I'm also very passionate, uh, passionate about outreach and science communication. Like I mentioned, that's really the main reason why I applied to uh, college. So you never know uh, by going out to these outreach events who you could influence, right? And um, so throughout my career, especially through the If Then uh, Ambassador Initiative, I've been lucky to be able to work with different organizations to increase science in, in the public. And recently I watched this movie and this line really stuck with me, uh, be kind to others, especially when we don't know what's going on. Um, this really stuck with me because we really don't know what is happening to our students or our peers or your professors. So be kind to everyone. Um, you know, if you know me, you know that my dad passed away right when I started, right before graduate school. and. Actually, when I was applying for faculty, I think my first interview, my mom was actually still in the ICU. So you really don't know what's happening in other people's lives. So please be kind to each other. Okay, so for now, the research portion of my talk. Um, my group started in 2021 at U of T in the Department of Chemistry and Chemical Engineering and Applied Science. Uh, we are at the interface of polymers, electronics, and biology. And what we're ultimately interested in is making electronics harmonious with the body. We leverage the rich palette of polymer chemistry to design new materials encoded with information for self-assembly, degradability, and electronic transport. And there's sort of three areas that we're excited to uh, use this polymer chemistry knowledge. First, we think about biodegradation of conjugated polymers into natural byproducts. So we think about all the electronic devices around us, you know, we had these really heavy computers and now we have these really light phones and watches, right? And I think this trend of electronics becoming more intimate with, uh, with us is going to continue. In the future, electronics will be more seamless, more functional and informational. We're already seeing examples of this in academia as well as industry. So in order to achieve these uh, new technologies, it really comes back to the types of electronic materials that we can make. And we look to skin for inspiration because skin is you know, flexible, stretchable, it can heal itself, and it's also degradable as well. And we've gotten pretty good at making electronics both flexible and stretchable. And there's really a lot of opportunity to think about making things intrinsically stretchable. And that's because I'm a chemist. Instead of thinking about all these engineering tricks, can we develop new materials? We've gotten really good at making semiconductors and conductors stretchable and even some examples of self-healing. But at the time when I started my postdoc, I felt that there was this gap and lack of materials that were also degradable. And these degradable electronics can really transform how we interact with electronics. First, it could reduce electronic waste. You can use electricity as a type of medicine that's local rather than pervasive throughout our body. And it can also temporarily monitor our health after an operation. For me, uh, my group, we're really excited to look around us and see what nature can offer and when we look to colorful items such as chlorophyll and carotenoids, we see all this color that have very interesting molecular structures as well. And in our group, we're really currently excited about carotenoids because if you look at the structure of the molecules, these, this family of molecules, they sort of resemble polyacetylene, which won the Nobel Prize in 2000. And if we look at the single molecule, it actually is pretty it has some electronic performance as a field effect transistor and it has some mobilities that can be usable. In addition to that, it has a very well-defined degradation pathway. However, these types of polymers or molecules aren't very well soluble and we are interested in making polymer versions of them. By making it into a polymer, we can change the energetics of these materials. And one thing that we're currently thinking about is how to make them soluble. And to do that, we add these solubilizing side chain groups, which we know from other types of polymer chemistry uh, research directions. This is uh, some early work for you to see. Uh, this is work that one of my first graduate students have worked on. Uh, she has made these carotenoid polymers uh, without a 
side chain, it turns into this black powder that's not soluble in any solvent that we could find. However, as soon as she adds her side chains on, we can see that it's soluble in chloroform and it has some very distinguishing shifts in the UV vis, which is indicative of the extended conjugated backbone. And so currently, Azalea is thinking about new ways of synthesizing these materials and understanding its morphology and implications on electron conductivity. In the second part of my group, we're interested in thinking about how do we make materials as soft as us, right? And so we look at functional bottle brush polymers. So all of you sitting and listening right now, your brain is actually moving quite a bit, if you can see in this image on the left panel. Now, if you stick something into this brain, our body re rejects it because it's trying to protect our moving brain and it, form, it encapsulates the device that we insert and therefore makes the device no longer able to communicate electronically with our body. In order to avoid this encapsulation, we can think about making materials really thin, like having a net or a fiber, uh, or yeah, like a really thin fiber. And these are sort of low bending stiffness architectures. However, these low bending stiffness architectures are still using materials such as metals and uh, a con a plastics that are still orders of magnitude harder than our brain, our heart, and our skin. So in my group, what we're interested in are conjugated and non-conjugated bottle brushes. And you can see in this image that the, it overlaps quite nicely with uh, biological tissue. It also opens up opportunities for areas outside of human health, such as deep sea grippers. When we take these bottle brush architectures um, designs, we need to think about how to build them and what we can mix it with to impart electronic properties. This is work that another first uh, student in my group named Angela is working on. She's doing a lot of synthesis of different approaches of using conjugated molecules and bringing them together in order to synthesize these pretty complicated conjugated bottle brush polymers. And she's currently working on synthesizing asymmetric polymers, understanding its composites, and integrating these into devices. So in the future, hopefully you'll see some work coming in this area as well. After we make our initial batches of material, ultimately we will blend these with inorganic materials and see how can we interface them with the existing engineering techniques that we know to make new types of devices. And then lastly, uh, in my group, we're also very excited about uh, building electronics from the bottom up. So in this area, we think about multivalency. Um, you know, if you go hiking, you, you get these burrs who, that stick to your, their socks and it, each of these individual interactions are actually quite weak, but when you have 50 of them, it becomes quite strong. And this is also true for Velcro. This concept is common also in virus binding as well. If you have a single binding onto the virus, it doesn't work as well as when you have a multi or polyvalent ligand. This idea has been used for highly sensitive biosensing of uh, agents such as Ebola. And here we can actually see that this globular system was able to sense uh, the biological agent at a much lower concentration than the other uh, non-multivalent versions. So in my group, what we wanna do is think about how do we capture this multivalency, but in a 2D format instead of globular. And that's probably because of my interactions with electronics. When you fabricate a lot of different types of electronics, they tend to be 2D so we can create layers of these materials. So we look into making sequence controlled electroactive polymers that can self-assemble, so building electronics from the bottom up, into 2D nanomaterials, and this, this can ultimately serve as a biosensing platform. We use peptoids, which are similar to peptides, but uh, more robust. <laughs> they can self-assemble into these 2D nanosheet materials, and this is some of the work that I was exposed to when I was in Dr. Ron Zuckerman's lab after undergraduate. 
And this is one of my favorite photos as well. Um, they're ultra thin, around five inches, but they're, they can be as wide as 100 microns long. And they're free floating in water, which is very different from a lot of 2D materials that may be free floating in organic solvents. We synthesize these peptoids using an automated robotic synthesizer on solid phase synthesis. And it's sort of really nice because you can just, as an undergrad actually, you just put all your chemicals you want into the robot and then boop, 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 uh, synthesize the peptoid that you want. And a lot of the amines are commercially available as well. So Jan is a, also the third uh, graduate student who joined my group in the first year. And he's interested into, in introducing different types of moieties into these peptoid structures. There's hydrophobic and hydrophilic uh, compounds that could be there for um, uh, driving the self-assembly, but there's also interesting moieties that we can include, such as polyacetylene monomers. Uh, Abby is joined in my second year, and she's thinking about stepping away from the robotic synthesizer and uh, figuring out how to synthesize this on a much larger gram scale. So um, more to come. You know, we're still working and figuring out this chemistry, and eventually Abby is going to be looking into drug delivery applications as well. So that's my group. We you know, think about how to make um, electronics harmonious with the body. So we need to think about how do we bring electronics together in water? How do bringing them together lead to emergent properties such as ultra softness? And how do we take, get rid of them from our body and uh, get them to degrade or even recycle? With that, I'd like to thank my research group, the best group in the world. <laughs> uh, this is a slightly older picture when I had to submit the slides, but uh, I really do want to thank um, Angela, Azalea, Abby, and Jan, who were the first four graduate students who joined my group. And then we had uh, four more new students who joined this year, as well as the alumni, all my funding agencies, and everyone here for your attention. And then lastly, thank you and congratulations to all the amazing Talented 12. It, it, it was really an honor to be in the same class as you. And I learned a lot by sitting in on these meetings and um, truly an inspiration. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. And thank you for that lovely last slide uh, for putting that together. That really wraps up the symposium nicely. I was struck by how, um, how many different areas of research your work uh, contains there's inorganic mm. materials polymers and i'm just wondering how do you approach moving uh into new fields and different fields Ooh, i think pr moving into new fields is because i had no idea what i was doing and now i've painted the story that everything is connected <laughs> but really i um you know i i was just guided by curiosity um, you know i started in the electrical engineering lab because there was this gecko poster about nanostructures leading to interesting um, mechanical properties. Then I sat in on Rachel Siegelman's course and I was like, ooh, polymers are cool. Let's go work for Ron Zuckerman. Um, and at that point, I maybe I realized that I wanted to make things and that's why I did my PhD. Um, and then afterwards, I sort of just wanted to work for someone who I thought would be an amazing mentor. So. Uh, they are different, um, and that's what makes, I, I hope, makes my group unique because we're bringing different topics together. But I would say just go for it. It's okay if it's a little bit different. And, and you may have heard from some of the previous talks as well. Uh, people make shifts all the time. You just have the courage to do so. Uh, I think like Gabe, right? I think uh, he was working more on synthesis and then now is doing all this uh, robotics and uh, self-driving labs. So I think you just have to go for it sometimes. Don't play it All too right. safe. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Helen. <laughs>